is uh, we're doing kind of an ab- Sorry. Abbre- abbreviated button-up workshop tonight or this afternoon. Um, normally, these are, are quite a bit longer, uh, especially when we're doing them live, like in person in town halls and libraries and things. But when COVID hit, we switched to kind of a Zoom model. Um, it's been going really well. Um, so this is kind of a shortened down version. Um, we're going to do our best to get through everything we can do, and we'll have some uh, time for Q&A at the end. And uh, I'll be available, you know, even after that, if people people uh, would like. Uh, it's sponsored by your your local utilities here. And uh, with, without any further ado, let's let's move along. If I can get my slide to work, there we go. All right, here's kind of an overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, you know, it's a lot of information. I talk pretty fast. So I apologize for that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. We're going to try to get through it all. Uh, we're not going to be able to cover every little thing on every little slide, um, but you can always contact me later or refer to the slides, you know, as you need to. Um, I saw a bumper sticker uh, after I was teaching for about 20 years, and I was looking at getting into the alternative energy or renewable energy sector, energy market kind of thing. And I, I saw this bumper sticker and that really kind of hit with me. Um, I usually ask the the, the the people who are in the audience this question, like, what do you think is the greenest energy? And as you can guess, there's a variety of answers. Usually the first one is solar. Everyone's always raising their hand. Solar is great. Oh, uh, no, you have to manufacture the pile, the, 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 the panels, and you have to mine the stuff. And what do you do when you're done? And someone says, well, hydro, you don't have to do that. Uh, and then someone says, well, yeah, but you got to dam a river. And then the, what about the fish? And someone says, what about windmills? I mean, there's all these different great answers for what is the greenest energy. But uh, when I kind of thought about it a little bit, I'm like, you know what? The greenest energy that's out there is the energy you're not using at all. It's, it's reducing your energy. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of some of those renewable energies that I just mentioned. I'm not putting them down in any way. I'm just saying that's that's energy production. And there's always a downside to energy production. There's always like a, a environmental cost or there's issues that come up with energy production in different ways. But if you're reducing your energy or conserving your energy, it's hard to make a, a real valid argument against that. There's not really any downside to that. So that's kind of why I ended up getting into the energy auditing field about 15 years ago when I was looking for sort of a, a change in pace after a, a teaching career. Um, the first thing we're gonna talk about is electricity usage in your home. Um, it's really hard to kind of talk specifics, but in general, this is kind of what the average household uh, electric um, allocation goes to. Um, you can see if you do have an electric water heater, that tends to be the biggest user in your house there. Um, it's not at the very top because this list is sort of weighted in terms of things you can do very easily to to lower this energy consumption. Um, so lighting is certainly up there for most people. Uh, if you don't have an electric hot water heater, obviously that might be your your top one. Um, but if you do have electric water heater, that's up there. Refrigerators, for obvious reasons, they're on all the time, right? Most people aren't doing um, dishes or running their dryer all day long, but your refrigerator is running all, all day long. So that's up there. Um, dehumidifiers are another one that some people don't know about. Um, I'm not saying don't use a dehumidifier. Uh, if you need to use one to keep your house from getting uh, you know, too humid or getting mold in your basement or something, that's a good use for that. Um, and you can see the other things you know, trickle their way down here. Again, this would obviously change based on um, you know what kind of household you have and you know how you're using your home. It can vary quite a bit. If you're looking at trying to reduce your electric usage, one thing you can do is go to your library and check out one of these things called a kilowatt meter. It's a little white box. You plug anything you want into it, put, plug it into the wall, and you can, with a little bit of math, you can figure out like what this one appliance is using. Um, can be kind of handy. Uh, another new thing that has come out in the last couple of years are uh, whole house electric meters. This um, screenshot down on the right here is from one called Sense. It's one of the, the leading brands out there. Um, they cost about $200, $250. You don't have to be an electrician to put them in. Um, you do have to have some, some comfortableness around electricity because you do have to open up your electric box and do some work in there. Um, but the really cool thing is that you can pull out your phone at work and you can say, oh, look, you know, my son must have just taken a shower because the electric, the water heater just turned off or the garage door just opened or somebody forgot to turn off the lights or someone is vacuuming right now. It'll actually identify the unique electronic signatures of each thing in your house uh, and it can you know sort of keep track of those over time. So if you have something that's like hardwired, um, you know, like a pool pump or your well pump or things like that or uh, 
sometimes those things can be malfunctioning and causing you high fuel bills and you don't really they're hard to track down that kind of thing because you can't plug that into a kilowatt meter so these whole house meters are really um, handy in that case um, you know I said they're about 200 250 dollars but after you you use it for a month or two or six you can always give it to somebody else or sell it to somebody else and it could make another round in someone else's house and help figure out what some of their uh, electric uh, abnormalities or mysteries are this is really silly and I kind of embarrassed to put it in here but like shut things off when you're not using them <laughs> Uh, I'm in people's houses every day doing energy audits, so I'm there for an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours, and these are people who are paying good money to get an energy audit to figure out how to reduce their fuel bills, and a lot of times I walk around through the house and there's there's a TV on in this room, and there's a whole computer bank in this room, and there's music going in the other room, and the lights are on in the basement, and you know, the, the homeowner's in the backyard weeding their garden. There's no one else there using all these things, um, so I think a lot of us have gotten into, you know, the bad habit of of just leaving things on when we're not using them so even there's some uh, you know behavioral occupant uh, changes that can happen to help you reduce on your your electric bills as well there are some things in your house that believe it or not are still on even though you hit the button that says off off doesn't always mean off um, these would be we call them phantom loads or vampire loads or drips because they're always actually using a little bit of power um, these would be anything with like a, a, a the plug-in chargers, things with clocks, remote controls, things like that. You know, when I was a kid, you would uh, you would turn the TV on and then you would go to the bathroom and get your snacks ready. And then by the time you got back to your chair, the, the TV would be warmed up and you could see clearly. Now, you know, Americans don't want to wait for that. So they actually have a resistor in there that is always using electricity for 23 hours a day <laughs> until that 24th hour. When Joe comes home and turns the TV on, it, it, people want it to come on instantaneously, so it comes on right away. But there's an energy penalty for that. Um, so these things are, you know, they're not, they're kind of increasing in number, and um, they're, it's a small little drip, but, you know, drips add up. Here are some examples of some things that uh, might be energy drips in your home. Um, the one second from the left, I think, is interesting, the Apple TV, the first generation of those things. When you had it on and you were using it, it used 21 watts of electricity. And when you hit the off button and walked away and you assumed it went down to zero, it actually only dropped to 17. So it's still using almost as much, it was using almost as much power off than it was when it was on. And it sounds crazy, but that's the way some of these things are designed these days. So the way to control that is to get yourself a power strip like this, a smart power strip, you know, like a lot of people work at home right now from COVID. If you have you know a printer a modem a monitor uh all these other things that plug in you, can, you don't have to have them on all the time you can have them in this power strip and you can sort of individually control them and when you turn them off using the power strip they actually are off and they're using zero instead of whatever it is they're using you know at a resting area If you don't have LED lights yet, I suggest you go out and get some. Um, they are a world different than the, uh, you know, the swirly CFLs that you might be used to um, that took forever to warm up and they had mercury in them and they didn't last long and everything. They didn't work with dimmers, even if they said they did. Um, LEDs are completely different. There's no mercury in them. They've come down in price tremendously. They will give out the same or more light than your other lights did. Um, so sometimes when I'm doing a, a project through New Hampshire Saves, I might be changing out, let's say, 10 recessed lights in someone's um, kitchen, in their in their kitchen. So I take out all 10 bulbs, put in 10 LEDs. All 10 of the LEDs put together sometimes don't even use the electricity that one of the old bulbs was using that we pulled out of there. So it's really a, a big difference. Um, a lot of times these LED bulbs are only using, you know, six, seven, eight, nine watts, and they're um, replacing something that was, like, say, 75 or 100. Uh, they also have these types of bulbs for just about any fixture you can think of. They even have them for candelabra, chandeliers, you know, just anything you can think of. There's pretty much an LED solution out there. The one thing I would caution you against is um, getting the ones that say daylight. I know that sounds wonderful. You know, people go to the store like, oh, let's get some daylight bulbs. It sounds so appealing. Uh, the thing about daylight, the, the, the Kelvin for that, uh, it's 5,000 Kelvin to be scientific. Uh, it's nice when you're outside, but when you're inside, it actually looks kind of blue, and most people don't like that at all. There's a picture down on the bottom right here. You can see the difference between 
um, what they call natural or, or daylight on the left, which is kind of bluish. And then on the right is what they call warm white or soft white. It's more of like a 2700 Kelvin scale. And that kind of approximates you know, the light that you would get from like a candle or an incandescent bulb, which most people find is you know, a little bit more soothing and acceptable. Other really uh, quick and easy, cheap things you can do. It's a you know, low flow shower head. A lot of people are worried there's not gonna be enough water coming out. Try it, I'm pretty sure you'll be fine. Most people find sometimes it feels like there's more water coming out when you have a low flow shower head. Um, you know, you're insulating all your pipes, uh, if, especially if they're going through unconditioned spaces like crawl spaces and attics and basements. Um, you know, pipe wrap is very, very cheap and it's very, very effective and it's very, very easy to put in. Uh, and make sure you're using your appliances appropriately. You know, your dehumidifier, um, like I said, use one if you have to, but make sure you're using it at the, uh, you know, the correct setting. And if you have an old one, make sure you're getting a new one and again, Energy Star ones. The old ones, uh, I can't believe some, some of the ages of some of these dehumidifiers I see in people's basements. Um, yeah, those are, are really, really uh, good to switch out. If you are going to switch out some of your um, appliances, uh, I don't suggest you go out and you know toss all your old appliances and get Energy Star ones. But when they are getting to the end of their useful life and they need to be replaced, you know, look for that Energy Star label there. Uh, that's going to cost you a little bit more in most cases, but the re over time, it's going to save you energy and money. And there also are uh, a host of different rebates that you can get for all these different products. Uh, you can go to some of these websites here to get more information about that. Anyway, so we'll move away from electricity now. Uh, you know, most of us, the real big challenge is how do we stay warm in our homes? Um, without just turning down the thermostat, right? That's not really an acceptable solution. Um, most people don't want to dress like this guy on the right inside their house. Like it's one thing to go to the store dressed like that, but you don't want to be sitting in your living room like that. So, you know, besides turning down your thermostat, which is unacceptable, what do you do to still stay warm in your house and use less energy? So that's kind of the focus. A little bit of, you know, high school physics, building science review. Um, some of the you know, basic facts are that heat always goes from hot to cold, no matter what. You know, that means it'll go out through the walls. If it's colder outside, it'll go out through the ceiling. It'll go out through the basement. Wherever it's colder, it, the heat is going to travel to. It's always going out through those, those, in those directions, no matter what, as long as it's colder out there. Uh, we can't really ever stop it completely. All we can do is slow it down. Um, these three terms you may remember, conduction, convection, and radiation, those are the three sort of major ways that heat works. Um, conduction is through a solid surface. Convection has to do with the movement of air or a liquid. And radiation is just, you know, the, the, the heat you might feel if you put your, your arm out the window while you're driving and you feel the sun on you. Um, you're not actually touching the sun. There's no air from the sun touching you, but yet you can still feel heat all the way from the sun millions of miles away. That's radiation. We don't really worry about that too much here in New Hampshire in terms of, uh, you know, improving our homes. It's usually um, focused on convection and conduction. Those are the two biggies. When it comes to conduction or how heat moves through solid surfaces, we have this term in the, in, in the industry called the R value. The, the higher the R value is, that means the more whatever it is you're talking about uh, is resisting the flow of that heat. So a high R value number is better. Um, lower means it's not as good at stopping that or slowing down that, that heat transfer. So it would be more like a, a, a conductor versus an insulator. This is a list of some of the more commonly used insulation materials that you might have in your house now or that you might get in your house in the future. Um, they all have different R values per inch. And some of them are as low as, you know, well, concrete is, is only one for, even if it's, 14 inches thick, your concrete wall basement is still only about R1. Um, you can see some of the higher numbers here are up in the six and sevens. That would be uh, spray foam and rigid foam boards and things like that. Um, you might notice here that, you know, a window, they don't really rate windows with R values, but if they did, it would be something like an R3. And that would be for like a, a new window. Uh, wood is about one, a little bit maybe more, depending on the type of wood. It depends on what kind of wood it is. The interesting thing about R value is that it really has a lot to do with how the insulation is put into. And uh, in my experience in people's attics in New Hampshire and walls and basements, there are a lot of people putting in insulation that have no idea what they're doing. 
Um, so they might be putting in something that says R38, but if you don't put it in correctly, you can drop that, the, the, the overall effective R value of an addict might drop down to R13 or 15 or 20 just because it wasn't put in right. So it's not just because of you know, what it might say on the label. Um, Hampshire is now finally following the 2015 building code. You'll be happy to hear. So we are only seven years behind. Um, we were following 2009 up until March. So we were really far behind. Uh, and it really was, um, well, it still is sort of uh, up to each municipality to decide whether they're gonna enforce that or not. Um, so they don't, they don't tell people who are moving here from out of state this, um, but it depends on what town you're in. Um, Durham actually is following 2018 building code. They have their own special place on, on, on the state website, but everybody else is supposed to be following 2015 building code. And you can see the R values here that are listed for the different assemblies in your house. Um, the average house is down below. Um, you know, I'm in attics that are R1 or R0, but most of them are somewhere between 10 and 30. Uh, and that may have been fine that, you know, the, the building code also is the worst legal house you can build. It's the bare, bare minimum. So um, nothing wrong with going going uh, higher than the, than, the, uh, than the R value. We have a little quiz here, gets back to that point I just made about, you know, if you insulated an attic with R38, but you left all these gaps, which are represented by those dark marks there, you know, what would the R value be? And most people are shocked to learn it's actually only about R13. And that sounds crazy, but if you think about it and you do the math, um, you could do a conductive heat loss of this assembly. It actually is true. Uh, it's because of the, the, the raging flow of heat loss through those uninsulated areas is just so massive that it sort of counteracts all the good things that the rest of that attic is trying to do with the R38 insulation. So install quality is super important. Well, different ways insulation can be messed up. It can be insufficient, which is just not enough R value. It can be incomplete where it's missing in certain spots uh, and it also can be misaligned, right? So on the left picture, you can see there, well, there's a bathroom fan there. First of all, it's dumping into an attic. That's not a good thing. Um, you can see that recessed light poking out of a, eh, two or three inches maybe of insulation. So that's certainly not enough. Uh, I can see some bare sheetrock in that picture. So that's certainly not enough. So that's insufficient R value. Uh, in the middle, you can actually see the drywall between those gaps in that fiberglass. And on the far right is, a, is kind of a classic case of sort of misaligned uh, insulation. Um, somebody actually did a good job. They used a really good material. Uh, it's, it's a foil face polyiso foam board, very high R value. And they did their end walls and their slopes in the attic. But yet there's a gable vent here. I mean, that's outdoor light that you're seeing coming through those little cracks. So they didn't quite get the whole concept because it's sort of like having a window open. So all that good insulation is not working at all because it's just not really put in right or it's not in the right place. And uh, this happens uh, quite a bit. Um, I won't embarrass anybody by asking, doing a little poll and asking people to you know, register their, their opinion about whether heat rises or not. I'll just spoil the, spoil the surprise and tell you heat does not rise. I know you've probably heard that a thousand times. I heard it just yesterday from someone, you know, heat rises. No, it does not rise. I already told you where heat goes, if you remember, I told you heat goes where? To cold. It always goes to cold. It goes, it'll go left, right, diagonal, up, down, north, south. It doesn't care. Whatever's cold, that's where the heat's going to go. But hot air actually will rise or hot liquid if you're talking about liquid. So it kind of appears as if heat rises, but it doesn't really. It's just that something is warmer than something else and it's rising. So people say heat rises. Um, and the way this affects uh, you know energy use in a home is that the warm you know you, the cold air comes in for free and then you pay to heat it up and then it becomes expensive air and warm air does rise because it is buoyant so it will rise to the top of a building uh it never stops there though there's always gaps and leaks and things and it'll escape well if all the air in your house is, escapes and doesn't get replaced you would kind of run out of air and you'd start to feel a little lightheaded so there's always a cold air getting sucked in down low to make up for that warm air that is constantly escaping out of the top. So that's kind of the, the rundown on how convective heat loss works in a house. We call it the stack effect in the, in the uh, you know, building science industry. It doesn't really happen you know, when it's equal temperatures outside, but the colder it gets, the more this happens. So our goal here would be to you know, 
not only have a good R value around our house, six sides, uh, it's also to keep that really expensive warm air inside as much as we can. Really easy to remember, you know, where the places where uh, it's leaking are, are the most prominent. It's ABC, Attic Basement Center. Uh, so the attic is, or the top of your house, if you don't have an attic, that's always where the, the priority is and where most of the air leakage is happening. The basement is the next one. And sort of counterintuitively, in where you live in the center is usually not the biggest um, culprit in this sort of heat loss scenario here. Uh, you know, the common air leaks that you, can, you find usually in the tops of a building are, um, you know, stairways and hatches that aren't weather stripped, um, chimney chases, pipes, things like that. What I have here is a couple of pictures showing um, stained fiberglass. That's one of the things that an energy auditor will look for in your in your attic, or you can look for it too if you're up there. Um, it's not mold or anything here. It's just uh, it's just like this pink insulation was actually pink at one time, but now it's all dark and stained. And that's because air has been going through that insulation since the first day it was put in there. So it will trap the, the pollen and the dust and all the contaminants in the air, even if it's sort of clean air, it's got stuff in it. So that gets trapped by the insulation and you just pull it back a little bit like I did here. And you can see like above this little wire hole, um, you know, air has been coming out of that since the day the house was built. And it's not just coming out of the, the bay right below that little hole where that wire goes down to a light switch. Because if you remember, your walls have electric sockets in them, which means there's a wire that goes across your wall through every single two by four. So air can actually travel, you know, through horizontally through uh, bays of walls and then get into this one and then go out through that little hole at the top. Uh, it'll happen in a one story home, two story home, it doesn't really matter. But if you give it enough time and put insulation over it and pull it back, this is usually what you see. So stained insulation is sort of a, uh, easy way to go and look for air leaks up in your attic. <clears throat> Anyone have any, uh, you know, think this is a good idea? This is a, uh, this is a, uh, a attic hatch I saw that was made out of pegboard. You know, pegboard is stuff you put in your garage. It's got holes in it. You move your little hooks around for your rakes and your shovels. Like, you know, luckily the, the, I, I didn't, I opened my mouth up and I was about to, you know, say, well, who did this? This is such an idiot move. And luckily it wasn't the homeowner. Um, he said it was like it's been like that for 10 years this is how i bought the house you know so for the last 10 years air has been spilling out through these little tiny holes into his attic expensive air um, not to mention that this is only you know a quarter inch thick this little hatch and wood is only r1 per inch so it's like r.25 maybe at the most so little things like this can uh, add up to quite a bit uh, let me see here so we have some uh, air sealing opportunities down in the basement. The common places in basements that leak are around doors to bulkheads. If you have a door, sometimes people don't even have a door to their bulkhead. Um, any kind of penetrations to the outdoors, like electrical, plumbing, um, you know, the sill plate kind of, you know, over time, the, the wood dries and it twists, um, foundations settle. A lot of times there's air sneaking in around those, um, those, all those penetrations and those joints down there at the top of your foundation wall. Um, and as we just spoke about, you know, with fiberglass has its place, but this is not a really good place for putting a square piece of fiberglass because uh, A, it doesn't have a really good R value, B, it's still going to let air through, and C, you can see that there's, in the corners, there's a whole bunch of places where it's actually not even covering. So it might be R19, but it's really only functioning at, you know, say R5 or R10. So not a really good solution for, for rim joists. Center of the house really doesn't have as many, um, you know, important air uh, exchange opportunities for, for sealing up. You know, if you have an old flu, uh, a fireplace or something like that, this has a bad damper, you can fix that. Um, pulley hung windows can leak a little bit, but most windows do not leak anywhere near as much as people think they do. Uh, they Windows will always feel cold if you're near them, no matter what, even the best ones out there. So um, we have a slide coming up on, on windows, but... Um, like I said, so the focus is going to be the, the, the attic in the basement. At some point, usually someone says, you know, well, geez, don't houses need to breathe? Don't we need to have fresh air? And, and the answer is yes, you do. Um, you do have to have fresh air, a, a certain amount of fresh air in your home for indoor air quality to be good. Uh, in most homes in New Hampshire, they're way more leaky than they could be. Um, so, 
you know, it's really hard to make a house uh, so tight that you, this becomes an issue. It can happen, but it's really hard to do. Um, we'll get into, you know, what to do about that coming up. You know, the main goal now is to, uh, the way of thinking about it now is to control that air leakage, that uncontrolled air leakage coming in around the gaps and cracks and holes. Um, but then you use something like this. This is an HRV. You can do, also do it with a really high quality bath fan where you're sort of um, expelling some of the stale, stale air in the house and you're bringing in real fresh air directly through a duct, not going through your mouse infested, you know, insulation in your walls. Um, and using a heat exchanger there so that you're, uh, you know, you're recovering as much of that energy as possible. So that's kind of the new way of, um, a newer way of approaching uh, houses. Of course, you also have to be aware of, you know, indoor air quality concerns like moisture, um, you know, storage of chemicals, things like that. There's all sorts of things in your house, radon, all sorts of things that can uh, lead to poor indoor air quality problems. So. You know, as a homeowner, you want to be aware of that. And if you get an energy audit, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, you want to make sure that that person is, is on top of that, too. At this point, you know, with a, with a quick little lesson there, you probably know what's going on in this house, right? Hopefully this isn't anyone's house on, in the audience. I don't think it is. I think this was taken over in Vermont. Um, but, you know, ice dams are a classic uh, clue that usually means... Well, one or two things are happening, or both things. Number one, there's not enough insulation in this attic, or maybe there's enough insulation, but there's just tons of places where the warm air from the house can leak up through the insulation or around it and get into the attic and make the attic really, really warm. When the attic is warm, it melts the snow, the snow comes down, it hits the edge of the roof where it's not warm anymore, and it freezes like it's supposed to. There's nothing wrong with the roof there. Um, the problem is that that attic is too warm. Uh, so that's a kind of a, a, a thing that a lot of people don't understand. They think there's something wrong with the edge of the roof there, and it's really not that at all. And hopefully now you know this is really not a safe and easy way to get rid of ice dams on your roof. I took this at a, a hardware store locally here in New Hampshire somewhere, driving around. Um, I mean, it's not false advertising technically, because if you do put this stuff up there, it will get rid of your ice dam. I'm not going to lie. Uh, the problem is... When it snows again, you're going to have another ice dam because this is only like a one-time solution. It's You haven't gotten at the root of the problem yet. Um, I don't think it's also very safe to get up there on a ladder with a 50-pound sack of the stuff on your back and try to sprinkle it around, you know. Um, so important to, to look at the root causes of these issues. You know, at some point you might think, you know, it's, maybe we need to get some professional help in here. And that's where a home performance contractor or an energy auditor might step in. Because um, they're going to look at your whole house as a kind of a whole system. They're going to do combustion safety testing. Um, they're going to look at how everything's all connected together, the crawl space to the attic, to the walls, that kind of thing. Um, BPI is one of the national organizations that uh, certifies and trains people to do this. Um, there are other ones out there, but, um, yeah, you want to look for, for somebody that has some, uh, some training and some certification. If you do get an energy audit, one of the things you might see is this big red thing, which is a blower door. A blower door is actually, actually, it's, it's code requirement now for every new home in New Hampshire to get one of these tests. Uh, I've been doing a few of these more and more for different towns. Um, Chichester, I just did one last week. They are now apparently uh, making sure that every new house there gets a blower door test. But there are lots of towns that, that are not doing this. Um, it's kind of uh, sucks all the air out of the house, essentially. It's a big fan. You close all the windows and doors, and you can measure the leakage of the house. So you can see how bad is this problem. Um, once you find out if it's a bad problem or not, um, which it probably is, then you can help f figure out where it's coming from. Um, you can also figure out, um, with this machine, you can figure out how, how tight can we make this building to save on energy bills before we have to start worrying about indoor air quality problems which gets back to that, you know, putting in a, a nature V or something like that that we talked about before. You, you can't just guess at that. You have to run a test to know. Um, another thing you might see if you get an energy audit done would be an infrared camera. An infrared camera is actually, it doesn't see through walls or anything crazy like that that people think it does. It actually, all it does is tell you the temperature of the surface you're looking at. And then it's up to the person to sort of figure out, well, what's going on there. So when I was looking at this wall here, the HOME sign, the home sign, well, the HO is really dark purple and the ME is just kind of a little bit purpley and then you have some other yellow in there too so they're all different temperatures they shouldn't be different temperatures there's something going on there 
Uh, so you're looking for, you know, things that stand out or anomalies and that kind of thing. Um, and this was an interior wall, even though it was a laundry room on the other side of that. So it's up to the person doing it to sort of figure out what's going on here. But the infrared camera can be really helpful for figuring out difficult things. Um, honestly, I don't use it in every situation, in, in every single audit, and I don't get anything from it all the time, but it can be really helpful. Um, you can also see, you know, air leakage coming in. So this bottom right picture, you can see that there's these like fingers or wisps of purple, which is indicates cold. Um, you can see those coming in where those wooden um, tug and groove is kind of going across that beam there. So infrared imaging can be really, really helpful, but not necessarily, um, you know, essential in every person's home. So again, you know, like, what do you do about all this, these problems? Well, first of all, you go back to your ABCs, right? Attic, basement, center, think about that. But you also have to think about air sealing has to come first. Um, you got to stop that air leakage first. It's really hard to get in there after you blow all this cellulose to go in and find all those leaks and fix them. It's a lot easier to do it first. And if you don't do it, then you put all this insulation in, the air is still going to be leaking out. So you've sort of solved one problem, but you're still not really solving the other problem. I kind of think about it like if you go skiing with a big down jacket on on a still day, it's not so bad. But if you go up to Cannon or something and the wind picks up, all of a sudden this really expensive thick down jacket doesn't feel that warm anymore because the air goes right through it, right? So Think about it that way. Air sealing comes first. This is a picture of a, a, a gentleman air sealing around a chimney. Um, you can see there's a couple different colors in there. The red is fire caulk because that has to be against the chimney. Um, the white is metal. The other stuff is foam. There's you know there's certain rules on how you can do chimneys and things like that. Uh, this picture on the right is interesting. Actually, this is a person who had all their insulation removed, and then there were so many little holes, they just decided let's put an inch or two of spray foam over the whole attic to seal it off completely and then they add the cellulose on top of that so there's lots of different approaches you know to how you would do this but there are definitely some you know principles to it that need to be followed these are more some pictures of you know you, what you might get if you if you did hire a home performance con a contracting company to come in you know through new hampshire saves or maybe or possibly not and to do work so on the right is a drop down stairway you know when i got there this was just open right to the attic <laughs> nothing there at all sometimes people have those little zip in tents that they don't really do a whole lot so this is a an actually insulated um cover over that with exterior grade weather stripping on it um and over there you can see another attic hatch um we got a barrier there to keep the sales behind an area that the homeowner wanted to have some storage up there um, so there's lots of different ways of sort of looking at all these different spaces and, and what to do about them. There isn't really any like, you know, oh, spray foam's the best because it has the highest R value per inch. Well, that's true, but that doesn't mean it's it's the best in every situation. Well, there are examples of, you know, sort of professional level uh, attic improvements. This person on the left, you know, really wanted to make sure they had some storage right around that little opening. Um, and on the right, same kind of thing. I think there was a, we had to build a little wooden barrier there and a walkway to get over to the air handler unit, which was on the other end of the attic uh, behind me in that picture. Um, and they did a really good job with this little, uh, you know, L-shaped insulated hatch that's, that fits over there when you're done. And moving down to basements, you know, first of all, make sure that if you have a water issue down there, things like that, you got to take care of that stuff first. Uh, once you do take care of that, you know, then you can start thinking about insulating the walls, usually the walls. Usually you don't want to do the ceiling in, in, in most basements because usually below that there's pipes, there's boilers, there's furnaces, there might be laundry. Um, so the walls uh, is usually the best way to get that thermal barrier on the six sides. So you got the top, the four sides and the bottom. Um, and that can be done in different ways. Um, you know, a lot of times this is good to get a professional in here to, to look at the best way of doing that. Um, spray foam can work, but it's not necessarily um, you know, it, appropriate in every case. On the top left, you can see rigid foam board is being used instead. Kind of a good before and after picture on the bottom. You know, obviously on the left was the, that's going to the, uh, the, the bulkhead. You know, a nice door in there does a great job. Center, again, not a whole lot you can do. Chimney balloons help, some weather stripping, things like that. But don't focus on the center. You want to focus on the, the A and the B. You do have empty walls, which there are lots of homes that have empty walls. Um, that is really not something you can do yourself. You have to get a, uh, a, a contractor to do that because the equipment that you might get like at Home Depot to blow cellulose in your attic is not the same as what you need to do this kind of work. So 
Windows, I, I mean, like I said, even the best window in the world is only going to be R4, R5, maybe at the best. Um, triple pane argon from Sweden, Germany, Japan, doesn't matter. It's still going to feel cold. It's still going to be the worst part of your house, most likely. So to spend $1,000 on one window just to make that little, like, six square foot area better and still have it be the worst part of your house that doesn't make a whole lot of sense um there's a lot of other things you can do that are a lot cheaper like cellular shades interior storms things like that so be a little bit creative don't just assume i need all new windows um because that's usually um you know not appropriate if you have it you know you, you really want to get your heating system replaced i mean not replaced serviced every year uh, i had mine done yesterday uh, even though it's propane, people sometimes think, well, propane and natural gas doesn't, no, it need, everything should be serviced and cleaned each year. Filters uh, changed, um, you know, carbon monoxide is a real threat, so make sure you have a carbon monoxide detector. Sometimes I bring this house, the, the picture of this house with me when I'm doing an audit for, you know, a young couple in a really, really old house. It's le I say, well, this house here is actually worse than yours. This is one of the worst houses I've ever actually analyzed, and that's Lake Winnipesaukee in the background there. Um, you know, multi-million dollar house, very, very new, but actually absolutely horrible when it came to uh, energy performance. Oh. So New Hampshire Saves has a lot of different programs um, for all sorts of different things. The one I'm going to be focusing on is the New Hampshire Saves uh, Energy Audit Weatherization Program, which is, uh, you know, here on the website, NH Saves. Um, well, first, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, heat pumps. Uh, they're great. I, don't, I can't get into this too much because we don't have enough time, but they are going to be, they're the wave of the future. They run on electricity, so your electric bill will go up, but your propane and your oil, whatever it is you're using to heat now, will go down. They're super, super efficient. Um, they do work in our climate, um, and there are some really good rebates for these. Um, so, but it's important that you, you know, work on improving your, your house first before you put something like a heat pump in. Um, so the program I was telling you about is the New Hampshire Saves uh, Home Performance Program. And you go to their website and you, they have this little test your home button. So you click on that. Uh, if you qualify for this, you end up getting an energy audit for only $100. Uh, and then out of that audit, you get a proposal of work. If you have the company do that work to lower your energy bills, uh, your utility will pay 75% of that up to $6,000. Um, they also have some low interest financing or some no interest financing, depending on, on who your utility is. So it's a really, really great program. Again, you have to qualify for it. And uh, we'll have a slider here, a slide or two here that shows you how to do that. Um, you go to their page and you have to put in your zip code, how big your house is, uh, and how much fuel you use. Um, you, you're allowed to only input two fuel sources. So if you have like three or four, some people have, I've, I've had people that have propane oil, wood pellets, and wood. Um, you have to contact your utility to figure out how to put all those in. There's a way to do it, um, but you put in all your heating fuel, you put in your heated square footage, uh, which isn't always your living space. If you get that off your property tax card, check because in some towns they will call like an unheated, you know, sun porch living space, but that's not heated. So you wouldn't use that square footage in, th in this scenario. So you can see this house is uh, 2000 square feet. They use 800 gallons of oil, two full cords of wood, and on the little speedometer there, they got a 9.04, which is good. That means they get in. Right now, it's a nine. That's how you get in. Um, about a year ago, it was only an eight. Um, so for various different reasons, they've changed it now up to a nine. Um, they say that they might change it again back to eight, which would be nice. Um, but right now, I believe it's a, a set at nine. So that's how you get in. And um, this is a kind of a sample, like... Uh, one of the pages of the report from a customer who did get into New Hampshire Saves, got an audit done, and this is what the, the plan is for their home. So it's $10,000 worth of work. You can see the total cost at the bottom on the left there is ten grand. Uh, the, the utility rebate is actually going to be $6,000. So they maxed that thing out. They're going to give all the money they can to this. And that leaves the 4109 for the customer. Um, so you'll get a report like this that will tell you all the different things you know, that are being proposed to your house. Uh, it's not a take it or all leave it kind of thing. Some people decide to do everything on the list that the auditor proposes, and some people, um, you know, pull some things out and cha change things. That's fine too. There's also a program for income uh, eligible people. Um, you know, the program I just told you about, it, like that house I showed you on Lake Winnipesaukee, believe it or not, they got like a $4,000 rebate three or four years ago from their utility. They didn't need the money at all. I mean, you know, they probably had, you know, yachts and, and cars and, and houses around the world, but 
um, because their house used so much propane, they got into the New Hampshire Saves program. Um, for other folks, it might be uh, more appropriate to go through the uh, the weatherization the weatherization assistance program or WAP. Um, there's the contact info there. Uh, in that case, you don't have to qualify by showing that you have high fuel bills or anything like that. Um, so it's a little bit of a different program, but same kind of idea. Oh, yeah, quick review. Yeah, we talked about you know, real quick, easy things you can do to save on your fuel bills. We talked about the ABCs. We talked about adding insulation wherever you can, all six sides. Um, we talked about maybe getting some you know expert work done or some help done with this if you're feeling like it's uh, you know something that, that is in that direction. Uh, which is pretty common, and then uh, you know take advantage of the New Hampshire Saves programs. Um, I should say that you know, those programs are um, they're changing uh, a little bit in the last year or two. It also is sort of um, highly dependent upon where you live, unfortunately. So depending on who your your utility provider is, that's going to determine um, some of the sort of the fine print of how this this works. Uh, I just kind of gave you the general outline of how the program works. Um, I believe right now Eversource and New Hampshire Electric Co-op are, you know, fully open and taking new customers. Uh, Liberty and Unitil, uh, unfortunately, are not in the same boat because of their, you know, they have different budgets. Um, so that's uh, just something you have to be aware of. This is my email if anybody wants to jot that down. If you have anything that comes uh, comes to you afterwards, um, feel free to email me and I can uh, I can help you out with any questions you might have. Uh, if you know any other, um, you know, usually it's towns that are putting this on or energy committees in towns. If you do know of anybody who might benefit from this type of program, um, here's the uh, the people who, who kind of coordinate it. It's PlymouthEnergy.org. Uh, it's Plymouth Area Renewable Energy Initiative. Um, they're the ones that coordinate that. So you can get a hold of them and um, possibly get one of these presentations uh, in your own house, or in your own house, in your own town. Uh, usually in a library or a town hall or things like that. So at this point, I think, you know, we can open it up to anybody who has questions. You can feel free to unmute, your, unmute yourself and uh, fire away. Thank you, Ted. Um, I think uh, you're able to raise your hand as a participant um, or just unmute and ask some questions. Okay. It looks like we got a few things in the chat there. I didn't get a chance to see that, but. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, I see one there. So uh, somebody's asking about um, federal tax credits. Usually when my customers ask me about that, I say I've been advised that I am not a tax professional, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I do think that there are some federal rebates you can take advantage of. It's usually only for the materials themselves uh, if you get a project done. So, you know, and generally speaking, that, that's about a third of the project most of the time. So let's say you, if you did a, a $9,000 project in your house, the materials for that project are most likely going to be around $3,000. So that's kind of all you could claim if you could claim it on your, your federal tax form, I think. Um, but it's not certainly not something I know a whole lot about. Um, but it's worth exploring for sure. Yeah, pretty sure correct about that. There are some new ones too for... Um, biomass heating systems like mm -hmm. uh, wood pellet systems and wood stoves. I believe there's like a 28%, some kind of federal credit for that too. Yes. Uh, that'll be Angie, New Hampshire would be a great resource for that too. Yes. That'll, that'll be decreasing next year, potentially if it's not renewed at that level again uh, for the, on, for the coming year. Well, there's an interesting question. Someone said, you know, can you respond to the argument that increasing your efficiency just encourages, encourages you to use more of it? Um, most of the time, I think that is proven false. I'm sure there are situations where that happens, but you know, when I got a car that had better gas mileage, I, I think, I don't think I drove anymore. I just, you know, um, yeah. in this case though, it, you know, I, I, I've had customers before who call up, like say after three years and they say, geez, Ted, you know, like that project you did was supposed to save us 500 bucks a year in oil. Uh, it seems like it's only changed, saving us like 250 or 300. So what, what was, was there something wrong, you know? Um, and a lot of times that's because A, the price of oil went up and the homeowner didn't realize it. Uh, also, sometimes it's that they just, they felt a little bit more less guilty turning the thermostat to 68 or 70 yeah. and taking off their hat and their gloves. Um, so in other words, maybe they had the audit, maybe when they had their energy audit done, maybe they were keeping the house at 60. Um, now that it's fully functional and warm and working correctly, maybe they move it up to 70. 
Um, but, you know, I think that's more the exception than the rule. Um, yeah. I think, still think it's a good idea to, you know, do the best you can with whatever you have. Yeah, that's that's classically called the rebound effect when you have yeah. these types of technologies. And the biggest one is LED lighting because it's so much more efficient that you yeah. tend to just leave it on. Um, but the the effects on the larger uh, appliances and things. So like your heating and things like that are still saving a lot of money. So you're still yeah. going to, to see a savings, even if you increase usage. Right. Yeah. Even if you leave. I, so I told you I was a school teacher. I worked at a private school and, and I remember before I left the business manager, there's always a friction between the business people and the educators, you know, and the business manager came into the faculty meeting. She's like, you teachers need to leave your, turn your lights off when you leave your classroom because we have an $800,000 a year energy bill. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, like, first of all, most of our classrooms were, were LEDs. Most of them had occupancy sensors. So if the teacher didn't move around, like the, the lights would shut off. Um, but even the ones that were incandescent lights or maybe fluorescent, like we could have left all of our lights on for the whole holiday break for three weeks. And it wouldn't even have been a drop in the bucket because we had buildings on our campus where the snow wouldn't even melt. I mean, it wouldn't even stick. It would just melt immediately because the attic was so, I mean, most of that $800,000 uh, a year energy bill was propane and oil. Very little of it was electricity and very little of that electricity was lighting <laughs> and yes. even less was, you know, classrooms where people leave the lights on. It's just, it's just sort of um, weird sometimes how people get focused on the wrong thing. Yes. Um, I can answer uh, Marco's question is that the current uh, funding for NH saves was extended to 2023. So we'll have to go through another round of negotiations uh, soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, beca because of that, because we they pretty much just extended the 2020 level through 2022. Um, so we'll be waiting on that. Um, yes, and those, the slides will be available afterward and we will be recording this. So this will also be available. Yeah, the, the funding is always sort of a, a perennial, you know, sensitive issue that is, is, um, hard to figure out sometimes, but. Yes. If you know that any of your, uh, representatives are on the science tech and energy committee, uh, in the, uh, in the house. Um, please contact your representatives and tell them that this is something that the state needs. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved, uh, please get involved. Yeah. I see a question in here about shutting off, you know, they shut their computer off each night, but what about the modem, the router? Certainly not my area of expertise. Um, I mean, if it's something you're not going to be using all night, I don't see why you couldn't shut it down. I know I shut down my, uh, whatever it is, the Comcast box or whatever. I shut that down all night. My wife complains sometimes because in the morning when she kicks it on, it has to like do its rebooting thing or whatever. So it takes a couple extra minutes. But um, yeah, I don't believe that, um, you know, I think, still think we're saving energy. Um, so yeah, anything you can shut down for extended periods of times, you know, if you can do it safe, I don't think there's any damage you can do to the equipment or anything like that. So no, I, I think it would be marginal savings. I think the bigger things you can do is, uh, unplugging larger appliances that will continue to operate. And yeah. uh, like you had said earlier, you can search to see what their idle usage is or get one of those meters to see what their idle usage is because it may be very insignificant or it could be something that's much higher. You could have a, a larger phantom load or something that you don't think is drawing a lot of power that is. Um, to influence the RPS, you should talk to your state representative um, and you can uh, get involved through us as well as an individual member or by signing up for our newsletter at cleanenergynh.org. There's a question in here about you know, safety and health concerns using foam insulation instead of, you know, instead of other methods. Um, yeah, that's really certainly is an area to be, to be concerned about. Um, there are greenhouse gas potential, uh, you know, drawbacks of using uh, not just like spray foam that's being made on site, but also, you know, rigid foam boards and things like that. Um, they're very, very similar in a lot of ways. It's just that that's made it in a factory and turned into four by eight sheets. Um, so yeah, it's something to, to keep your eye on and research. We, I do have customers that, uh, you know, are convinced that that's 
not something they want to be a part of. So we do our best to find other ways of doing it. Um, you know, in a lot of situations, you can do that. In some situations, though, it's really, really difficult to find something that's going to work and be effective and not cause problems. Like, let's say in a basement with like granite boulders that are all you know rough, um, very, very difficult to find, uh, you know, any kind of uh, insulation that you can put on there uh, besides spray foam. Unfortunately, there are some new spray foams, too, that um, where they're looking into soy based blowing agents, things, things like that. So they are getting mm -hmm. better at that. Um, but it's definitely is a concern. And I guess, you know, you could look at the, the lifetime cost of the material and how much oil it's going to save or propane versus, you know, what went into it. That's a, a really hard <laughs> thing to sort of um, figure out. Um, so, yeah, but whenever I can, I like to use cellulose because cellulose is, uh, you know, it's a made out of recycled newsprint and things like that for the most part. Um, so that, that's one of my favorites. But again, you, you can't use that in every situation. Yes. Um, I was recently uh, at a session that was talking about the, using um, wood pulp to make types of uh, pulp blocks, boards, and fill. So very similar to cellulose, but yeah. in a more... Uh, I guess you'd call it original product as opposed to secondary product sense, which is what cellulose is. Um, and that was very interesting. They're going to be a company that's based here. So I think the, the fact, the manufacturing plant is going to be based in Maine um, and they're going to be, be making others in the area. So taking the refuse from wood mills that are already being used, making that into insulation. So mm. it'll be a byproduct, but first, first iteration product, very good R value, very good fire resistance, very low on the issues that could come off of it in regards to health issues or byproduct. Right, right. I see a question in here about um, putting a cupola or cupola, couple, I can't always get that word wrong, uh, on your barn. Uh, I can't really see that coming under a rebate unless you're, and if your, bar is, if your barn is heated and you're doing a bunch of insulation in that barn and you're getting a rebate for that, um, it could potentially be a part of the attic ventilation because attic mm -hmm. ventilation is oftentimes part of the project, like putting in soffit vents or ridge vents or gable vent. Um, so yeah. it's, if it's functioning in that type of capacity and it's sort of needed as part of um, the ventilation strategy in, in an, a weatherization project like an attic, then in theory, maybe, but um, otherwise, probably not. Uh, any other questions? I think I heard somebody there, but I couldn't make out what you were saying. Uh, feel free to unmute and ask a question if you'd like as well. Hi, this is Bonnie Christie in Hopkinton. Hi, Bonnie. Um, hi. Just, hi. A great, great program. Um, I Thank want to have this in, done in our library as soon as possible. Um, great. But, yeah, uh, I don't think we've done one in Hopkinton before, have we? Well, if you did, it was probably a long time ago, and I think a lot of yeah. people would be receptive to it because of the prices now. Yeah, um, oh, definitely. Yeah, they. We usually wait. We try to wait like two or three years to re, to return to towns, but uh, yeah. even if you have had one, if it's been a couple of years, they will definitely be open to uh, you know doing one there. Yeah, and um, I just I'm I'm putting in heat pumps, and I, um, you know, my contractor said, oh well, they've used up EverSource has used up all its money for this year, there's no rebates left. And um, so I, I called Eversource and I got customer service and they didn't really know anything about it. And they sent me to billing and they didn't know anything about it. And they sent me back to customer service and then yeah. finally well, got a phone number for New Hampshire Saves and I it rang, you know, I was on hold forever. And then I called the office of the consumer advocate and he called Eversource. <laughs> or New Hampshire saves and they promised they'd get in touch with me, but they didn't. So well, how do we get through? I just, why don't you, if you want, you could send me an email at that email address and I can give you the contact person at, uh, at Eversource. Um, I, I think, did you ask the same question in the beginning in the chat? I can't yeah, remember. I did. So, yeah. so I, right before we started, I emailed my contact at Eversource and I said, what's the status of heat pump rebates right now? And he said, this is a quote, the program is open for business. Okay, good. Thank so you. That sounds encouraging to me. I, I mean, it's, yeah. it's kind of light on specifics, but you know, um, I'll, I'll put you in touch with this person and you can go from there. And I think that'll, that'll cut out some of the other, mm -hmm. 
Okay, yeah, thank you very you much. Know. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It can be difficult sometimes to get a hold of people at some of the different utilities. Uh, I'm a little surprised because Eversource is actually the one that's easiest to get a hold of. Yeah, uh, you get you know straight answers from really quick. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry that that happened to you. Oh, that's, thank you very much for the help. Okay. Well, if that's all of our questions. We're up at the hour. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Ted's email is up right here. My email is joshua at cleanenergynh.org. Um, I hope that uh, we had answered all your questions. If you have any more, feel free to email us. Um, our website, cleanenergynh.org, has a lot of answers to this. Also links to the NH Saves website. Um, and we'll be around to answer any of your questions. Thank you. And I hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.